There's that nasally drone. All right, here we go, folks. This is the Ask a Painter live show. I am your host, Nick Slavic. I am the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. I'm also the host of this show, Ask a Painter Live. It's a weekly live Facebook show where I use my over yeah, two decades, really. This is my 29th year of painting uh, to answer any questions. And uh, I shouldn't even just say live Facebook show. It originates on Facebook. It is here on Instagram as well. So Alan Murray... How's it going? Oh man, we already got a whole bunch of people watching. This is awesome. So as normal, you guys can comment anything you would like, any topic, any question you want to go through. Never been stumped yet. Very proud of that. Um, and then uh, I'm going to talk about two things that are very important to me, super ordinate goals and grit. Hello, everybody. And uh, <clears throat> I'll talk about a few other things. Uh, I will say this first. Um, I am doing a special edition of the Ask a Painter live show uh, for a number of reasons. It is, I live in a town called New Prague. It's a Czechoslovakian community. My last name is Slavic. We are very Czech. We are very German. We are very Eastern European here. We actually have our big town festival uh, this weekend. It culminates, uh, I shouldn't say culminate, it kicks off with a major event tonight. It's a huge, huge, huge car cruise. And um, there are thousands of people. There's going to be four to 500 classic cars in town tonight. They do the car parade. We get all the families together. Thousands of people will descend upon New Prague tonight. They close down Main Street, and it is quite a sight to behold. So I want to make sure that um, I am there for that tonight. Uh, so we're going to do this a little earlier, but also tomorrow morning. <laughs> Tomorrow is Deer Archery Opener in Minnesota. I usually don't miss an opening day. So I am going to be uh, sitting in a deer stand when I normally do Ask a Painter. Now, I did have a thought that ran through my mind of, if I'm not seeing any deer, do an Ask a Painter from a deer stand. I have not done that yet. I've done it from fish houses on frozen lakes. I've done it from all sorts of places. The deer season runs from now until about January 1st. So I'm assuming that in that new box blind I'm building, you will probably get an Ask a Painter live episode somewhere this year yet. So I'm not going to push it. I'm not going to uh, spook any animals on that. So number one, can't wait to see everybody downtown at my festival. It is an amazing time. Way more people show up here than should for a town than our size. Also, good luck to all the hunters out there. Stay safe this weekend and enjoy the outdoors, man. That's what it's all about. So Okay, Phil Klein, Vision Quest. Yes, my friend. So we're going to talk about some things that we talked about on the Ask a Painter Live retreat. We went deep on limiting beliefs, superordinate goals, grit, and long-term visions, things like that. Now, we don't have two and a half, three days to do that here. So I'm going to talk about superordinate goals and grit. Um, First, I should, uh, we, we can't go too far without mentioning the PCA though. So um, thank you to the Painting Contractors Association. Last week, we had a national board of directors meeting here and people from all over the country flew in, uh, all the officers of the board, all the directors, the executive director, employees of the PCA. And we did a whole bunch of updating and we started talking about vision and strategy uh, for the next five to 10 years. And what an inspired group of people. And uh, I love this certain feeling when you're the dumbest person in a room and because it lets you know that there's something to strive for. And it also gaps you. There's a gap between where you are now and where you see everybody else. And I love getting gapped as it's called. I love getting gapped. I love seeing what's possible, what's out there. And I cannot wait to sort of like become more mature as a leader, especially from a board of directors thing like that. So, oh man, thank you everybody. Uh, <laughs> Pete McDonald, Nick, it's 10 p.m. here in Ireland. How you doing, man? Uh, wow, this is great. I'm glad. So one of the things I like a lot about doing these weird, odd special shows is we catch people like that because normally we would, uh, we would not catch you guys. So uh, awesome that we can get you here. Uh, I'm enjoying a session weed ale today, uh, just getting ready for the old uh, festival this evening. And uh, I would urge you, uh, if you're in Ireland and it's 10 p.m., uh, raise a pint, raise a glass. Uh, if you're like, uh, you know, maybe Phil Klein, uh, who's in Iowa, just, just south of me here, uh, still working, put me out of the background and listen. So, all right, folks, if, if you want to get gapped, if you want to be the stupidest person in a room, if you want to know what the possibility of thought and action is, Join the PCA, the Painting Contractors Association. Um, people, people from the PCA, 
People from the PCA have taught me a lot of the things that I know now. They also challenge me in a way that I've never been challenged before. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. Noah Tucker, thank you so much for that. Um, superordinate goals are long-term goals, but they're not just long-term goals. They're not a goal that's going to happen a long time from now. A uh, superordinate goal is the goal to rule all other goals. And this is <laughs> this is something that um, I am very, very interested in because I started reading and uh, I was very interested uh, about grit uh, in the last couple of years. Now, I am I am fully under the belief that you need grit and information to succeed. And I'm getting parched, so give me a second here. I believe you need grit and information. The, the interesting thing is we're running out of excuses. Almost all the information is free out there. I mean, God knows, if you're watching this, this is the perfect example of it. Think about what we've been talking about this year. I was just listening to my favorite podcast, Advice from a Young Tradesman, Noah Cantor, friend of the show, best friend of mine in the industry. He just gave one of the best treatises ever on what to do in your first year or two of a painting company. And I posted it on the Paint Ed Group. Go look that podcast up. Um, if you've been through your first year of business, sparks will be going off in your head. If you've not gone through your first year or two of business, that's exactly what you should do. What's interesting that Noah said was over the last year, uh, because of COVID and things like that, I started doing super hardcore job costing, goal tracking, um, job description, deliverables. I went, I went nitty gritty on the unsexy, mundane, boring stuff that actually professionalizes your business. Noah followed along and even mentioned in the podcast, he just was doing what I was doing, learning with Ask a Painter along the way. And there we go. And here we are. So a uh, huge compliment from Noah. Also, God, that guy is thoughtful. And uh, it's an amazing, it's an amazing podcast. I would urge you to listen to it. But Noah was at the retreat and he is one of the person who challenges and pushes me the most in the industry. I love this guy. He comes from an outside point of view and he is very interested. Uh, when I went to Vermont to visit him, basically all we talked about was superordinate goals. Now, <sighs> Superordinate goal. Again, not just something that's going to happen in the future. It is a goal to rule all other goals. If you want to have $8 million of capital in a bank, liquid assets, if you want to have a business that runs without you, if you would like to have options for your family and friends to get into this business, if you would like to become more involved in the community, what you picture your life as. You can you can make superordinate goals the big overarching thing. 50 years from now, what do you want to do? You can make a superordinate goal be a fitness goal. You can do lots of these things, but oh, the superordinate goal is something that's long-term. The problem is we like to think this as visionaries of these companies, we like to think about superordinate goals they're very sexy. I want to be a $10 million company. I want to have a hundred employees. I want to have a business that runs without me. The problem is that we don't take any steps tomorrow in order to get that goal done. So grit plays a role in that because a superordinate goal, you can watch Ask a Painter. You can buy the book Traction. You can get any number of coaches. You can watch YouTube. You can go to any, any, you can go to the PCA and get all the information you want for free or next to free. The problem is, why doesn't any everybody accomplish this, right? Why doesn't everybody who starts a painting business run a $10 million, $100 million painting business? Because it's hard. Any business is hard. We're not, this isn't an industry that's harder than other industries. We don't have it any harder than any other business out there. We, as visionaries and entrepreneurs and business owners, there's two things that will stand in our way of success. It's shiny objects and grass is always greener stuff, uh, side projects, things like that. Hey, listen, I am not even making money on painting, but you know what? I'm going to start a pressure washing division. And you know what? We're going to start carpentry as well, too. And then we're going to start doing flooring and refinishing wood floors. And if, you're, if your castle, if your little solidarity is not good and profitable, being distracted by these shiny objects is going to take away from that thing that's already teetering and it'll implode on itself. So somebody who has enough grit to identify a superordinate goal and change their life 
in order to get it, they succeed in a big way. There's people like this in my life. I look up to them. I am not a compliant sort of guy. If somebody lays out a system in front of me, I can usually function within it. My first instinct is to come up with a new system, improve that system, or somehow tweak it to get better, faster, or something else. There is a story. This is hard for me. Superordinate goals, staying compliant with something. Um, exercise is a great thing too. I, uh, a great example of that. I get insanely bored. I get insanely bored with fitness and exercise and all that stuff. Um, I enjoy, I'm really utilitarian. So if I'm going to do something, I like cutting down trees and clearing brush because it's great aerobic exercise. But then at the end of it, you have something to show for it. The antithesis of utilitarianism for me is sitting on a treadmill and going for 42 minutes. And then you aren't three inches farther than when you started. It's very, very hard for me to do that. So I have to trick myself into doing that. So I change whatever I do. Um, right now I am walking my dog, uh, between four and five miles most morning, but it's not just a walk my dog. I do two things on that walk. I call it my ideation walk. I have a goal of something to think about and I disconnect from my phone. I take a phone that's not connected to the internet. So all it is is a Spotify playlist that, you know, is not connected to the internet. I can't text. I can't check anything. I can't even call. And I'm forced to have successive thoughts uh, that I normally wouldn't. I can go about six or seven to 10 uh, more questions and layers deep on a particular topic when I'm not distracted by other stuff. When I'm sitting in my office here, I'll see an email, I'll see a Slack message, I'll see a, something on the drive, and I'll get distracted. I can't, I can go three thoughts deep, I can't go 10 thoughts deep. The ideation walk does that. Also, I'm training my dog to hunt. So as we're doing that uh, on our walk, I'm not only ideating, but I'm also getting reps in for about an hour and 20 minutes every day with my dog training him. So to me, that is insanely utilitarian. Not only am I doing something that I can't do otherwise, this, this deep ideation, I'm also seeing results in my dog and I'm also getting exercise. That's like a triple threat for me. So it's the antithesis of a treadmill. So when we think about superordinate goals, being like Jason Paris, being like Noah Cantor, being like me, or being like any of the other people, Dave Scaturo, Gina Court, uh, Christian Militello, all the people we know and love from the industry, doing exactly what they do may not be right. You have to tailor it to yourself. We each have grit in our own way. Some people have a ton of it, and this comes easy, and they love compliance. Some people have lower grit, and you actually need to work on getting that grit up. Um, let me go through some comments here while I organize my thoughts, and then we'll keep going here. So, oh, man. Jerry, uh, Jerry Williams, how's it going? Anthony Cade, how are you, man? Beach house painting. Anthony Cade, dude, 10-hour days are, are where it's at. Yes, it is. I love it. Phil Klein, Vision Quest, man. So we actually nicknamed um, the Ask a Paint of Live uh, thing Vision Quest, uh, the retreat Vision Quest. It was a lot of fun up there, so. Oh, D. John Walker, first time watching. Thanks a lot, man. Mike Wojohn, fellow Minnesota painter. Uh, Justin Fry, unexpected episode. That's right, man. Keep everybody on their toes here. Noah Tucker, thanks a lot, man. This is this shirt is uh, is my honorary. Uh, you IGers can see it. I brush Elkid. Uh, my best buddy Zach Kenny gave this to me. It's a very special shirt to me. Uh, he's a nerd like me, a martyr for the craft, and uh, yeah, we we dig this stuff. So, uh, <laughs> Aaron King, hey. I started recruiting a large, large, uh, of about a four and a half month process of recruiting here, um, Aaron. So I have a voicemail waiting for you. And the second I get a chance, I'm getting out there and taking a look at it. So Ryan Blakely, distractions all around. Absolutely. Justin Fry, shiny objects. You got it, man. Uh, David, howdy, boss, man. How's it going? Uh, thank you for rocking yet another great video. Absolutely, man. Ah, this is a question I love, David. Then we're going to get back to superordinate goals. How did uh, do a 10 hour day uh, day with weather changes and stuff? So everybody always says, yeah, what happens when it rains on Tuesday? And I will say the exact same thing to you. What happens when it rains on a Friday? My people aren't working. We've got all our, our work done in four days. So you'll say, wow, if it rains Tuesday, what do you, what could you possibly do? Two things. Um, statistically, because we worked those four days, there are days where it rains Fridays and we get lucky and we've already done our 40 hours before the rain starts. The other thing that we do, because we live in a world of first principle reasoning, we try to limit our limiting beliefs. 
and go forward. A limiting belief would be, how could that ever work? Because what, what, uh, how could it, when it rains Tuesday, what do you do? So we have an insanely effective, aggressive production team led by Holly and Shane. And within about 12 hours, they can take an entire company, a $2 million company and move them inside on a 12 hour notice on a day like that. So they are very good at this. They plan ahead. Uh, they're very aggressive with communication and uh, they get it done. And, and, and yeah, I'm very proud of the work they do. So ah, yeah, <laughs> Sam Chandler, 60 grit. That's right, buddy. All right. Let's see what else we got here. Da, 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 da. Okay. So super audit goals and grit. Um, the problem is, uh, like I said, why doesn't everybody who has a startup painting business, uh, succeed and, and, uh, become a shareholder in their own business and not paint anymore because it is hard. Uh, and I would argue all the information is out there. Some people just don't have enough grit to go out there and get it and do something with it. Um, the people that I admire the most, uh, not even just in this industry, but successful business people, successful husbands, mothers, spouses, wives, whatever, uh, they have a bias to action. So I think this is something that comes natural to me. It might be a little cheat code, but when something needs to be done, I just start. It's just a natural reaction. Like some things you maybe write down a plan, some things you maybe start a spreadsheet for, but if your first instinct for everything is to either spend money or do a spreadsheet until it's perfect and then start, that is not a bias to action. And, and it's likely that it will take you a long, long, long time uh, to get anything done. The people that, <clears throat> the people that I see have the most success have a bias to action. They start doing stuff. They look to fail quick. It's not that they expect to fail. It's that they do something. They look for the friction points and then they act on it. They learn from those things that went wrong or those friction points. They keep track of those things and never repeat them. So it's this constant improvement kind of wheel like that. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to watch. And, you know, I, I'm, always, uh, I'm always cautious of saying like fail fast because that's sort of like saying, oh, yeah, when I was going through college, there was this sort of uh, business maxim that always got tossed around. Well, entrepreneurs are always the D students. And you know what? You got to go bankrupt five or six times before you succeed. And I think that is complete BS. Um, I think that is an excuse. I think that's a limiting belief. I think, it, I think it's an excuse that unsuccessful business people tell other unsuccessful business people. You can say, I went bankrupt and I failed. Or you can say, we iterated really quickly. We learned, we adjusted, and we did something else. Um, that's more. That's more effective way to go through it. <clears throat> so grit. Um, I'm, I'm still always cautious to talk about pop culture businessy terms, you know, the, the, and again, take no offense if you love this book, but to me, the whole 10 X baby Grant Cardone sort of thing, it's fine. <clears throat> I didn't find a whole plethora of data and statistics in that book. And I didn't find a lot of action items, uh, besides just do 10 times more. Um, I didn't find it all that helpful, to be honest. And it felt like more of a bro book where people pump their chest out and they put their fist in the air and they yell 10X baby, and then they move on. Now, not to say it's a bad book, but I really, really try to stay away from pop culture business terms. Grit can be one of those. You say, yeah, you got some grit. Grit can actually be scientifically quantified. Um, there is a social scientist by the name of Angela Duckworth, and she wrote a book on grit. I'm still making my way through it. It's a very dense sort of read for me because it actually is a data and science based book, <clears throat> but they actually quantify what grit is. They have surveys to kind of figure all of that out. They can tell you how to improve grit, which is the one thing I was looking for in that book. Uh, when we went on the ask a painter live, uh, retreat, we actually all took Angela Duckworth's grit test. And if you watched ZK live on Instagram this week, Zach and I actually mentioned it. Very funny. Zach Kenny shirt. Zach Kenny was in the room. Zach Kenny got the lowest grit score in the room. Now, 
I think he was just probably being the most honest out of all the group because it's a highly competitive group of people. And I think we all might have been juicing our scores a little bit or we think a little better about myself there. Uh, so that was really interesting to see. Uh, but you can take this grit test. Um, it's uh, if you look up Angela Duckworth grit or grit test. I mean, it's a very easy one. There's there's uh, there's ones between like, I don't know, I can't remember if it's between 10 and 13 questions really quick. They're pretty subjective and there is a bias to our own opinions and subjectivity. So you have to be careful with that. But um, yeah, I uh, you take that. It's helpful, um, but you probably already know the results, uh, really. So grit, what's interesting to me is that, um, there's a story actually, maybe I'll get to a couple comments here and then I'll get to a story about a hall of fame pitcher. Um, all right. Da, 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 da. We found that all the excuses for 10 hour days never come into play. Anthony, that's exactly it. Every, so this is, this is the thing always, which is like, how could you possibly do virtual estimates? How could you possibly print an estimate out on site? How could you possibly only work for 10 hour days? How could you possibly hire somebody without any painting experience? Those are all limiting beliefs. And what you need to do is use first principles reasoning and say the first step in first principles reasoning. First principles reasoning is a way to solve problems. You break down the problem to its fundamental little pieces and you explore your assumptions about that. Most people's assumptions are absolutely wrong. You ever hear there's no good people out there? That is a massively false assumption that every single person in our industry and now every other industry holds. You first have to call yourself out on your own BS. And most of the time, if you're honest with yourself, these assumptions are false. So the, the three big knee jerk reactions uh, or the pushback that people give to a four day work week, uh, they're basically not really the problems. There's other stuff that comes up, of course, but they're not really the problem. So, yeah. Anthony, you know, man, you're a thoughtful dude and you've been practicing now too. So Ryan Blakely, bias to action is greater than paralysis by analysis. I've only just recently learned this, but it's great. Just do it. So if you look on, on the Painter Facebook, you know, any of the groups that we follow, a lot of the times you see this paralysis by analysis. Like people just ideate and ideate and ask questions. And because they're not given an answer that they want, they keep asking, they keep making spreadsheets and they never just try something. One of the most beautiful things that you can ever get as a business owner is a pure data point. If you're wondering how to do an estimate on site, challenge yourself to just do one on site. Just say, if I had to, if I was going to be given $4,000 as a bonus, if I do this estimate on site, I bet you, you could do it, right? I bet you, you could do it. So remove the $4,000 bonus, add a little grit and just get it done. Try it. Just even if it takes you two hours, you have a data point. You say the first on-site estimate I ever printed out and handed in the same appointment was two hours. Now, next time, here's the friction points that came up. These three things. My tablet wouldn't connect to my printer, so I wasted 20 minutes doing that. So tonight, I'm going to sit here and make sure that it connects. And then the first thing when I fire up my little mobile command unit in the morning, I'm going to make sure it connects. And on the next estimate, you've taken 20 minutes off. That's a 10% saving time in that thing. So... David, I love failing. I learn a lot, teach others what not to do. That's it, man. Okay. I think there was one more here and then we're going to get to grit and the hall of fame pitcher. <clears throat> no drip painting. You mentioned your production team. What are some of the other responsibilities? Well, this is something we should actually talk about uh, sooner or later. You, you bring up a really good, um, you bring up a really good topic for a show. Uh, I should actually have Holly on here um, uh, to, to explain her role. Um, so production team, um, we may do things a little bit different in my company. We add in a lot of the admin and coordination roles uh, with our production team because that's how we've done it. And we use first principle reasoning. And we said, you know what? We can get by without an admin or a coordinator for a long time. So basically the general idea of my production team, we have a manager and then we have, uh, we have, a, we have a production manager. So Holly is my right-hand person in the company. She's been, uh, she's got most seniority. She's been here the longest of the leadership team. And, um, she has a project manager, Shane. And uh, basically the, the idea is Andy and I, the, I'm the sales manager. Andy is the estimator salesperson. And we sell a job. The second that a client says, yes, put us in your queue, we do a special handoff to the production team in a very formal scripted way. 
And then basically the production team takes it from there. They discuss scope, they discuss color, they discuss schedule, they get the crews scheduled on it. They make sure all the supplies are there on time. They discuss any weirdness. They help, uh, we do change orders with them if that's the case. They set the project up, they get it going, they see it through, they do quality checks, they close it out and they invoice. And then there's a whole bunch of admin and coordination stuff. My production team actually does all the job costing because it's fresh and top of their mind and they like to be connected to it because they're bonus by it. Um, and they do, you know, there's, there's about 14 other things, uh, admin style. They update our goal tracker and all this other stuff and, uh, update the bonus stuff. And, uh, but yeah, basically the general idea is after a job is sold, they see it through, they are production, they get it done. It's where the rubber hits the road, uh, in the company. So hope that answers your question. Okay. So <clears throat> you want to talk about grit and a superordinate goal. This is sort of how I think about it. There's a Hall of Fame pitcher. I'm not a sports guy. I forget his name. Angela Duckworth actually used this example. But in his long major league baseball career, he would not vacation to places where he could possibly get sunburn or he protects against sunburn because if he were to get sunburn, he couldn't train. He would injure his body to the point where he couldn't train and keep up his performance. He would change his diet. I mean, this is a pretty straightforward one. He would change his diet so that he was healthy enough to have a long career and his body would respond to it. This is how you know that somebody has a superordinate goal and they have enough grit to change their life for up to two to three decades to that. He would not pet a dog with his throwing arm in case that dog would bite that throwing arm and not allow him to throw a baseball. That is somebody who knew what a, what a superordinate goal was, the long-term goal, the Hall of Fame, a long-time major league career. And he actually did something every day. He changed his life. Sometimes it's a sacrifice. Sometimes it's not to see it through. So I would challenge all of the Ask a Painter viewers and my brethren and sister then out there. What is your superordinate goal? And this is something that actually took me a long time uh, to sort of figure out. Once you go deep, once you go deep and figure out your superordinate goal, you have to figure out, you have to backtrack from there. If your superordinate goal is 20 years from now, you have to make benchmarks along the way. I would argue every year, every two years, three years, five years, something. But if you just have that as a goal and you don't connect where you are now to where your superordinate goal is, you will likely go many, many years without making any progress on that. So there's obviously books like Traction uh, that deliberately help you with something like this. But it's as simple as saying, you know, hey, in... Uh, in 10 years, I want to have 20 employees. So, you know, the common math would say, well, I'm going to hire two people a year. And in 10 years, I'm going to have 20 employees, but you're not looking at attrition. And so attrition is going to be there. So you're going to say, well, you know what? Uh, let's plan, let's pad it a little bit and let's hire four people a year so that if we get 50% attrition, then we're going to have a 20 person painting company in 10 years. And then you're going to have to start looking, well, if there's 20 people here, who are we going to need to support them? And then you say, well, you know, we can't just add them when there's 20, we're gonna have to add them along the way. So basically in, in 10 years, if we have to do this, we're probably gonna have to add our first production manager come somewhere between year, year three and year five. And then year six, we're probably gonna have to add a salesperson, maybe year seven or eight or nine or even 10, we're gonna have to add a coordinator. But if you have all this stuff mapped out, it's not gonna be a surprise and you're not gonna be reactionary. So um, it takes a lot of grit uh, to stay in tune with that stuff. and and. I'm going to answer some more questions, do some more comments, wet my whistle a little bit, and then we are going to talk about how to get more grit, more grit. That's the thing I'm very, yeah, I'll talk about that in a second here. I got a lot of thoughts. Sam Chandler, what's the population in your market? So it depends how you define market. My town that I'm in right now is about 7,700 people, 7,800 people, but we service kind of the whole Southwest Metro uh, of Minneapolis, St. Paul. So I've, I don't actually know what that is. When it, when it gets bigger than your, I mean, really, if we're picking from employees, you really have to say 20 mile radius, uh, really at the most, give or take, that's kind of our market for it. So we are rural. I mean, my God, people, if you can look out here, I mean, this is a farm. Uh, like I said, we we used to have two stoplights in New Prague. They took one out and now we have one stoplight again. So this is, so the interesting thing is 
when people ask about my market, yes, we're obviously not just doing business in my 7,800 person town, but it becomes a really interesting conversation when you're in Chicago and somebody says, listen, Nick, fine. What you got going there is special, but you don't know Chicago. There are no good people in Chicago. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? You have Chicago to choose from. Millions of people. You can't find two. It's just, it's insane. It's a limiting belief. So uh, interesting. So we are going to talk. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how deep to get on this stuff. So there's basically like two principles of how to get more grit. One is superficial. One is kind of superficial. And one is actually takes a lot of grit to get more grit. So the easy one, the superficial one is looking the part. Um, there's a scientific term for it that I forgot. Uh, it's not something that sticks in my brain because it doesn't, it's not naturally intuitive that it explains that sort of thing. But basically it's, it's a social science term that basically says this, if you look the part, you will actually perform better. And there is a whole series of some insanely interesting scientific, um, studies and tests that they did. Give me one second. One of them directly relates to our industry, which I thought was really cool. Cause a lot of this stuff, when they start talking about doctors and lawyers, you think good, they're people and we can take something from it. But what about our trade? Are we different? Um, one of the social science tests that they did was they took a bunch of high school students, I believe they gave, they broke them off into two groups and they gave them all white smocks. So, you know, the kind of long jackets that hang to your knees, things like that. They told, they told half of the people, uh, Giuliano, how's it going? My friend, Bon noche. Um, they told half the people that these white smocks were doctor smocks and you are doctors. You're going to be acting like doctors. So think like a doctor. The other half of the people, the other group of the people, uh, they told they were painters, <laughs> which is hilarious. You are painters. Think like painters. They gave them a series of math tests. Guess what the outcome was? The people who were told they were doctors did better on average than the people who were told they did painters. Now, I don't think they told the painters that they were all residential exterior house painters. I think it was more like maybe decorative painters or things like that. But painters, nonetheless, that's as close of a study to our industry as we're going to get. It feels stupid, and I feel stupid even saying it, but it is true, and it's bore out by science. If you look the part, you're going to do better. You're going to act differently. There's a reason. Uh, I haven't been technically in the field for many years now. I wear white button up shirts with a logo on it. And I wear my painter's pants and I wear painter's boots. I mean, my God, my, my favorite pair of red wings, you know, my Irish setters right here. I still dress like a craftsperson, not only because I am, but because if I was just wearing, you know, coral colored pants and a, and a trendy t-shirt all day doing estimates, people would take you less seriously. If I was in the field wearing ripped up jean shorts, and an old uh, Green Bay Packers shirt with, with the armpits blown out from sweating in it too long, clients take you less seriously and you feel less professional. I've wore a button-up shirt for 14 years on the job because I feel it's important to be better than average. I know it's not going to be the only difference in my success, but by God, I'm not taking any chances. And you know what? It elevates you a little bit. So you would never, ever, ever hear me say, that that's the first thing you should do, or that's going to make a difference. But you know what? No excuses. I'm devoting the rest of my life to this. I am doing everything to the farthest extent that I can do it. Now, that's an interesting sort of quirky thing bore out by science. That's easy to do. That's a low hanging fruit, right? If you still act like a jerk, even though you look the part, it's not going to be effective for you. So there's lots of other things that have to happen. So what I will say is, I'm, again, the, the term escapes me for the second way to get more grit. That is, that is one way to get more grit is to just physically look and act the part. Uh, the second one is again, another social science term that doesn't, it doesn't feel like it describes the thing, but it's basically training and it's practice, but it's not just any practice. It's intentional practice with feedback. And this is the thing um, that I, in some areas of my life, I do very well. In a lot of areas of my life, I do very poorly. Um, if you've ever read the book outliers 
uh, if you've ever read some of the other sort of like, um, uh, you know, uh, that outlier kind of stuff, um, I don't know if it's fallen out of favor yet, but one of the things that um, the author of that book pointed to that outliers did really well was intentional practice. And it's not just doing something over and over repetitively like a robot. It's almost that fail quick cycle and that reiteration of failure. It's practicing, getting feedback and changing practice, active practice, actively changing, looking for faults and friction points, making note of them, not repeating them and moving forward. That's a lot harder, but honestly, that's the way to get more grit. So the one interesting thing for me, when I started going down this thing of grit, because, you know, when somebody very much smarter than you says, Hey, Nick, I feel like if I just summarize this whole thing, I feel like you need grit and you need information. And you're like, well, grit's squishy. Grit is weird. And I, my first reaction was, well, I think you might be born with it. <laughs> like a personality type. Like, yes, you can probably tweak personality type by upbringing and other stuff. But honestly, I feel like a lot of that's kind of there already. Like there's a big foundation for a certain personality type in you. And then your upbringing can kind of tweak it uh, one way or another. But I don't know that I could drastically change uh, the deepest part of my personality type right now. So I was worried that you were only given so much grit and by God, you had to do what you did with it. But it made me very happy to find out that you could actually mess with your grit and get some more. Now, what is intentional practice with feedback and constant improvement and failure cycle look like? I would argue that one of the ways we've been able to do so many things so fast is we intentionally practice as a company. Uh, we intentionally practice as a leadership team. So, um, a great example would be, you know, starting up drywall or carpentry this last year. Um, what we didn't do was wait till we had a guaranteed win before we launched it out into the world. What we did do was, listen, let's get it 80% and then let's launch it. And then let's quickly take up that last 20% as quickly as we can based on this failure iteration cycle uh, like this. Intentional practice could just be a, a try and stuff doing very tightly controlled uh, scientific experiments where you have a control group, you have a test group, uh, you only change one variable at a time so you actually know what you're doing. You make note of that variable and how much or how little it changes, and then you tweak another variable and you just constantly check things off or add things or remove things until you get something. So Dominic Crowley, oh man, so glad you were able to watch here. Um, Friday night, ask a painter on Instagram. So, all right. Uh, David Koger, what's your opinion on Stallmeister uh, and Richard Excellent Pointed Sash Brushes? So uh, I got a package uh, from my friends over in the Netherlands a bunch of years ago. I used the living daylights out of those things. I saved one Stallmeister, a rounded one. It's so beautiful, just the craft of it. And it works so well. I just save it. I didn't want to use it up. So I love them. I love them. Now, they're not production brushes, obviously. We're not painting the exterior of a house with them. But you know what? For somebody who like restores old windows and stuff like that, sometimes it's just fun to do stuff like that, right? It's an awesome tool for that. Uh, I like it a lot. Uh, those are great things. So, um, so in summary of all this stuff, this is tough. Taking the time to think about a superordinate goal is tough, right? If you're still painting, you have to paint. And it's likely that you have to do estimates and then do your job costing and then put ads out and then uh, look for employees and all this other stuff. I understand. But taking, I mean, even an hour a week, I take about an hour and 20 minutes a day, that ideation walk. And as business owners and entrepreneurs, it feels like we sacrifice to do some things. I would urge you to start out even once a week and take an ideation walk, force yourself to disconnect. And there's some times where I have such an intentional plan to ideate on something, to think about something. I don't even turn music on because I don't want to distract myself. I force myself to say, listen, you will dwell in this thought because the way my brain works, if I dwell in it long enough, I'll start questioning it. And then I'll ask myself these questions and then I'll have another thought and a successive thought. And if I let that dwell for 30 seconds, I'll find some way to counter that and say, well, yeah, what about this? That is so beneficial. Now you might be able to do this while you paint, right? If you're alone painting, that's great. 
it's exercise, it's ideation, it's revenue generation. It's just awesome. Now, um, if you're, if you're in a state like me where I constantly need to be reacting and creating things, uh, especially this time of the year, we're in a heavy creation and recruiting uh, period. I don't necessarily have time for a bunch of ideation that takes an hour and 20 minutes at a time. So I have to force myself to do that. And I cannot force myself to sit in a chair, close my eyes and do this with my hands and do that for an hour and 20 minutes. I go absolutely crazy. So I have to walk. And then sometimes that's not enough. So then you got to train your dog and that's how I trick myself. And that's how I, you know, uh, that's how I sort of, um, um, justify what I do with that. But I will tell you, however it works, whatever you can do, even if it's an hour a week, that equals 52 hours a year. If you can just force yourself, schedule it on your calendar to say, I am going to think about 10 years and 20 years and 30 years down the road and what it's going to be like, what I actually want. You're not going to nail it on your first shot. You know, some people may have it figured out. That's great. You're very fortunate. Um, I know my superordinate goal and, and you can have 15 of these superordinate goals, but my superordinate superordinate goal, the goal to rule all goals has taken me a lot of years and, uh, to, to, to focus. And every year that I go by in business, I learn leadership lessons. I become more mature as a, as a leader of people. And that goal changes based on what I learn. So, um, it's a very interesting thing, but by God, I would urge you to go take that grit test, just search the internet for grit test, make sure it's the Angela Duckworth one, uh, and then start figuring out what your superordinate goal is. And remember, like I said before, if it's not written down, it doesn't exist, write it down. Um, there's things like traction that will actually guide you through this process and do a whole bunch more, but really write this thing down. And then basically it's as simple as, and this is one of the things I love the most. So it's easy for me, but if you have a 10 year goal, simply, simply write down what that 10 year goal is, where you are now and what has to happen every year until there, it can be as simple as how much revenue is different in that 10 year Divide it by 10 and say, oh, we have to increase revenue that much every year. At least you have an idea because in where you are now in the next year, there's going to be a number there and that's going to be associated with how many more painters, how many production people and this and that it's going to start focusing that. And it's going to start again, 80%. It's not perfect. It's probably not going to follow this path, but now you have it. Now you can start punching holes in it, looking for friction, failing fast. And that cycle of reiteration, uh, that cycle of failure keeps going and going and going. So, uh, Samuel Chandler, I ride my ideation skateboard. I love that man. So, one thing I'm always careful to is, uh, I have a I'm trying to think now 25 year old Cannondale mountain bike. It was the first bike I ever bought, uh, with my own money. That's a super nice bike. Uh, I ride, I like, I get sick of walking sometimes. So I ride that. And again, you guys would love this. This is how much of an insane person I am. I can't just go for a bike ride. I take checks and I go bike them over to the bank and deposit them and then ride back. That's how insanely utilitarian I can get sometimes that a bike ride is not enough. Now, the problem is even with a bike ride, uh, sometimes it takes too much of my brain power because you're moving through the countryside faster. And I don't find myself doing that ideation thing. I can't turn off my brain to the stimulus around me. So walking is off. <laughs> Sadly, I hate to say this, but like walking is the way where it's, it's a, it's my dumb, dumb activity where I don't have to think about it at all. And my brain can go deep really quick. So yeah, there's even limits to what my brain can do biking versus walking. So Anthony Cade, I think a lot of us have grit. Um, but can we take that grit and harness it with discipline and better our business? To me, that would be the ultimate goal. Yeah. So it's, um, it's consistency too, right? Grit can be consistency. Uh, people think they have grit, but really what some, what most people think of as the, the pop culture term grit is basically, Hey, I work three extra hours today, or I work 72 hours a week. But if you're not moving your life forward, that's just labor. And a lot of times it's extra labor. So you can say, hey, Fernando, Bonoche, my friend down in Brazil. Um, so you can say, I work 80 hours a week. And I will tell you, you might have two crappy underpaying jobs, two 40 hour a week jobs that are really crappy. You think that just by, by gritting your teeth and gritting through that stuff, and just by ah, this, that that's grit. I would say that grit is not using 
your main brushing hand to pet a dog so that if a dog attacks it, you can still paint the next day. One of the things that I found myself doing unconsciously before I knew anything about grit and all that other stuff was this. Um, no drinking on Sunday. Didn't even have a beer on a Sunday because you know what? I'm in bed by nine o'clock, eight thirty, nine o'clock. I start reading a book. I start, uh, you know, reading an article on my phone. I want to get a good night's sleep because four o'clock Monday morning, I don't want to be that guy who lights a fire, sits there listening to music uh, till one thirty in the morning. And then I got to get up the next day. I have altered decades of my life so that Monday morning comes around. Nobody's fresher on a Monday morning than me. You might say it's a sacrifice or you might say that's what grit is. And in order to hit a superordinate goal, I'm not already down a half a day trying to recover from the weekend. So it depends what you consider grit. I would consider grit two decades of that. A little small sacrifice to get a big result in the end and to set the culture for the company and things like that. So Dominic, inspired by your apprenticeship program, um, we're up to five people shooting to have 10 for the spring. Dude, that is a huge jump. Uh, Dominic, my resources are yours. Anything you need, you email me, you get a hold of me. We do it. Uh, you, you know how to get a hold of me. So, uh, I would love, I would love to assist if you need it. I don't, you got this, but we're here for each other, man. And I appreciate that. So, all right, folks, that is it for me. Um, God, I want to go deep on that. So I devoted three days with some of the top thinkers, the top challengers in the country on this. And what I want to do is sit here and give you the whole treatise, but I can only give you a little. Um, this is something that I've been really interested in for the last bunch of years. Um, and I want to share it with you guys and the rest of the thought leaders in our industry. So Michael Crane, again, one of the thought leaders in our industry, these are my people. And I, I like doing this with you guys. So if you want to do this with more people, there's the PCA for you as well. The painting contractors association, we are gearing up for a major, major event. It will be two years since we've got together for an exposition or the expo, as they call it. It's going to be in Orlando. I believe it's going to be in March of this next year. We have not gotten together in a big, professional, formal way in two years. I would urge you guys, let's do this. Let's absolutely do this. You guys will not be disappointed. Taking a one hour of your week and doing an ideation walk or sitting in the dark, ideating, uh, letting your mind wander, feels like a sacrifice. It is absolutely not. You will be eternally grateful you did it. Same thing with the PCA Expo, same thing with master's classes. It is a sacrifice. People have come out on August Thursdays when it is 86 degrees and sunny and sat all day with me to go over solving the labor crisis and how I did it. It is a huge sacrifice. And they probably woke up that day saying this is going to be a freaking waste of time. Guess what? Everybody universally at the end of this stuff was like, oh my God, the value is there. Same thing with the expo. Uh, the value is there. You will not walk away saying, eh, eh, you know, fine, it's good. You will walk away on fire and uh, you're going to go back to your business, a changed person. So, all right, everybody. Thank you for all this stuff. I'll check in with you guys. If you need accountability partners, that's what we're all here for. Uh, take some time to ideate. Start working on that superordinate goal. Nothing would make me happier than a couple episodes from now we take the superordinate goal and we start sharing with each other what that is. That is a really informative sort of discussion. So, all right, everybody, thank you for watching. I appreciate this. I will be in a deer stand early tomorrow morning. Good luck to all you hunters out there. Stay safe. And uh, we're headed out to the town festival tonight. So thank you all for watching. I appreciate you guys being flexible, doing this, we doing this uh, so it suits my life a little bit here. And uh, have a good weekend, guys.